Welcome to the Caribbean Cricket Podcast, your one-stop shop for all things West Indies cricket, by the fans, for the fans. Yes, 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 ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another edition, another episode of the Caribbean Cricket Podcast. I'm one half of the Caribbean Cricket Podcast, Mashal St. Patrick here, and with me as ever is my partner in crime, Santoki Nagilendran. Santoki, how you doing? Yeah, Mash, all good. And you know what? I think we missed a trip by not copywriting the phrase, never a dull day in West Indies cricket, you know, because we had plans, you know, to do an ODI 11 video ahead of we're 48 hours from the first ODI between West Indies and England we were going to do a straight video we might include that if we get time or if not we'll do a separate video looking at that but so much has happened Mash in the past few days it's not like every day has been a week in and of itself in West Indies cricket the amount of drama cuss outs we've had a retirement we've had withdrawal from hosting um a one a world cup next year there's been so much going on we thought you know what let's just have a video to dissect it all and get sort of summarised what's been going on in West Indies cricket, because it has been a dramatic few days uh, for West Indies cricket. So, Mash, we've called it West Indies cricket, you know, the Netflix drama, and that's no exaggeration. So I think the headline, Mash, is really, let's talk on let's talk on Shane Dalwich. So for those of you who might have missed the news, Shane Dalwich has announced his international retirement from uh, West Indies action. And this is only, he. when did he get recalled? He got recalled to the West Indies side last week after a three-year hiatus. So Shane Dalwich has announced his international retirement. First things first, before we get into sort of the, the theories going around online about it and sort of our takes on it, Mash, what was your first instant reaction upon hearing that news? Because it sort of came out of nowhere. 100%. It, it, it came out of the blue. Um, I think the way I found out was you texting me saying what Dalrich has retired and I, like, I don't know what I was doing or where I was at but I know I wasn't prepared for the news whatsoever it wasn't like I'd heard any inklings from anyone that this might happen and I guess you and I briefly kind of tried to work out what it might be to do with uh, and so on and so forth um but you know what was even before we get into Dalrich and what it means and so on and so forth what was even more interesting to me once I dig uh, digested that Dalrich had retired was the fact that they explicitly stated there will be no replacement mm. for Shane Dalrich. So before I could even get into breaking down what's going on for Shane, that statement in itself for me was quite loaded, Santoki. Because if you're not naming a replacement for Shane, why was he A, selected in the first place then? What was his role supposed to be if you're not naming a replacement for him? Because quite a lot was made about, remember the press conference, quite a lot was made about, you know, we think he can bat in the middle overs. He also gives us an option as a keeper. Uh, he's shown some form. It's time to bring him back into international cricket. So if it was so important to bring him back, how do you end up, Santoki, explicitly making a point of saying there will be no replace, replacement? What do you make of that, Santoki? Yeah, I think that's a very interesting one. And that was also my first reaction. I mean, not calling a replacement, as you said, Mash, they were bigging up how essential Dalwich was for the side and what he could provide. So not calling up a, a replacement. First things first, if Shai Hope does get injured, let's say, hopefully not, but if he got injured in the first LGI, where do they go? What, what sort of their backup? And secondly, Mash, it just makes you wonder, sort of, what were the reasons for Dalwich's inclusion then? If Because essentially they were saying he was expendable to the side. It wasn't really necessary because they don't need to name a replacement. And I think when you add it into the fact that Darren Bravo, with the whole Darren Bravo saga, which you brilliantly dissected in an individual video. So if anyone wants a full catch up on the Darren Bravo saga, go check out Mash's video from a few days ago on our channel. Um... But if you're looking at it in the context of Darren Bravo not getting selected, it sort of, it just adds a lot of confusion, Mash, and it will only fuel further speculation about sort of what the selector's policy is and what are their motivations behind certain selections. Yeah, for for, for sure, and I mean, ultimately they 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 go forward now with a, with a fourteen person squad. I think to be honest, Santoki, I th uh, you could argue by saying there will be no replacement. What, on one hand, you argue, well, at least they kind of killed the elephant in the room immediately, or addressed the elephant in the room, I should say. But on the other hand, 
again, you could argue it's a bit of a PR own goal to to be like, well, there'll be there'll be no replacement. Even if they had said, boy, he's in, uh, he's he's retired, so we're just going to call up Jamal Hamilton. Then everyone would have just shut up because then they would have been like, oh yeah, because they needed a keeper and so on and so forth, right? But again, you leave yourself open to scrutiny by by stating there will be there there is no need for and there will be um, no replacement. But moving on to the, the retirement itself, and actually just as we started recording this, Santoki, I've I've received an alert on my phone to mm. to tell me that certain stories and rumors that are coming out of um, out of um, the Caribbean about the reasons for uh, Dowrich's retirement are are nonsense. To, to say the least. So earlier today, just to explain that to people, earlier today, I had been notified by sections of the Bayesian press. I'm going to call out the Bayesians this. Sections of the, <laughs> 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 sections, sections of the Bayesian press had um, indicated that Dowrich's absence was due to f- people not treating him right and so on and so forth. Um, I've, I've subsequently had this um, completely denied. By, by people within Cricket West Indies who would who wouldn't who 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 would be able to know if this was true or not. Um, obviously, Santolki, I don't know. There's only so much that we can talk about with regards to this. So all I will do, Santolki, is lay the facts on the line that we do know of. Right? Three years ago, Shane Dowrich left the England tour in 2020. Um, he got. I think he got injured initially. Um, Josh replaced him for the second test. Then he went to New Zealand and he left that tour. I think they the official uh, the official press release was some personal issues that he had to attend to. Dowrich then didn't play in West. Well, he's never played in West Indies colours again. But he didn't feature in domestic cricket again for I'm going to say at least a year, possibly a year and a half. We didn't see him in domestic cricket. About a year ago, maybe just slightly over a year ago. There was um, a story that came out that he was, I don't know if he was suing Cricket West Indies, but certainly a case was brought against Cricket West Indies with regards to his contract or losing his contract and what he felt was or what was not done right with regards to him uh, losing his, his, his international contract. And then within the last year, we've seen him come back into domestic cricket, obviously most recently playing for the CCC and captain in them playing for Barbados, I think, last year in, I want to say, first class, if not Super 50. So to all intents and purposes, it's suggested purely on from an outsider looking in with no kind of intel about what was going on for Shane. I know he was playing some league cricket over here for Leamington as well this past summer. So um, to all intents and purposes, Shane's been playing cricket again. Obviously, he's got his recall. Now, like I say, I've had it poo-pooed, from members of Cricket West Indies that it's nothing to do with falling out with members within the camp or people not talking to him right and so on and so forth. But it's still, Santoki, leaves it open. Because when you release a statement which just says, man says he's retiring with immediate effect, <laughs> this is the West Indies. Everyone's going to start having stories about why it must be and this, that and what not and who cuss who and what happened in camp and what didn't happen in camp. Shane's and what I will say, Santok, is Shane's business is Shane's business. If yeah. there is a personal reason for this that he has asked Cricket West Indies, please do not do not disclose my business. Or West Indies are um, West Indies are respecting uh, Shane by just saying, you know what, man said he's retired. We we thank him. We move on. No one can say anything about that. Not us. Not any media in the Caribbean. Not outside the media. Uh, not outside the Caribbean. We just have to respect um, his wishes. But because of the nature of the Caribbean, Santoki, rumours are going to be going on for quite some time yet. There, I've set you up. What? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I delivered that monologue, you know. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, Mash, I think um, I think you've hit the nail on the head. I think, um, obviously, firstly, it's not our place to speculate as to why he retired. As you said, we don't know what's going on in people's personal lives or what the issue could be related to, but we're going to go on facts. And I think if you're looking at the optics, which West Indies seem to have messed up a lot in recent times, the optics, the fact that he'd been given a big recall, Mm. went to the training camp and suddenly announced his retirement. I know in the past we've seen international players leave at the beginning of an actual tour after playing a match. 
Uh, um, but I can't remember someone retiring after being selected and pretty much just doing one day on the training camp. It's, mm. It leaves it open, as you said, to so many interpretations. And then it leads to other questions, which have already been fans have already been asking. If he was going to retire, why did he get the? Why did he take up the selection? And then if it was a case of there were no issues leading up to his selection, between the point of selection and arriving at the training camp, what exactly happened? Like the, mm. there's there's a lot of gaps for a lot of fans. And then, as you said, in Bayesian media, there's been reports out today stating that he had issues with players and management in the camp. But I know you said, obviously, that's been discredited by Cricket West Indies. But if you're a fan reading those reports, it sort of fills the blanks. It fills in the narratives. It sort of answers yeah. the question. So unless there is some sort of reason which is clarified, as you said, West Indies could come out and say... um he had personal reasons which he didn't want to disclose. We respect him at this time. I think that would end the matter. But while mm. it's kind of been open and the whole the whole ambiguity of it all, you're going to get fans speculating. And I think, especially when there has been recent selection dramas with Darren Barvo not getting picked, I think it just adds fuel to the fire mash. And we sort of got this chaotic situation at the moment. And there's a lot of big questions being asked about what is going on behind the scenes in West Indies cricket at the moment. The only thing I will just add, and it's, and I'm being, I'm trying to be so careful with this because I'm, I, I want to do right by Shane here and not try and delve into frivolous uh, speculation. But just coming off the back of what you said there, if all was not well with Shane before he got selected, why on earth was he selected? And it raises questions about: Did anyone actually check in with Shane and say, yeah. "Are you, are you ready to play international cricket?" Like. Are you, are you ready for this? And it sounds ridiculous, Santoki. It sounds ridiculous that we're saying, did anyone check in? But this is West Indies. Like, <laughs> as ridiculous as it sounds, if you and I found out tomorrow, nobody asked him if he actually wanted to play, we wouldn't be surprised. <laughs> we wouldn't be surprised in the slightest. So, so the whole thing just begs the question, how much due diligence was done with regards to whether Shane felt up to coming back into camp and coming back into international cricket. And of course, as, as, as you correctly pointed out, Santolki, even if, even if I'm saying that the rumours that we were told are frivolous and there's no basis to it, what is obviously clear is something happened once he got to camp. Yeah. Now, again, we're going to just respect, we're going to respect Shane's wishes if or respect the process here and kind of leave it alone. But just from looking at it from a factual perspective, it points to something happening in camp. And and Shane, at the bare minimum, Shane getting there and going, no, I can't do this anymore. But we don't know what the catalyst would have yeah. been for Shane to come to that to that realisation. Yeah, that and I think it's, 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 it's important to say, obviously, like you said, we're not putting any of this on Shane Dow, which we wish him the best mm. in his future endeavours. But in terms of looking at sort of from a West Indies cricket point of view, the optics and how everything sort of played out, it just leaves more questions than answers with a lot of fans. 100%. Now, that in itself, Santoki, we could end this episode right here and say, well, boy, that's a big piece of news, you know. Shane Darich has retired. And actually, sorry, we should just clarify as well because we didn't do it. It's worth pointing out to people that put some respect on Shane Darich's name. Shane Darich retires with an average of 29, which on the face of it, I think three centuries, maybe eight fifties, I can't remember. Um, on the face of it, to a fan outside of the Caribbean, they might say, well, whatever. But between the, the between that period, but I think between 2018 and 2020, that England tour, Shane was probably the best performing batter that we had in the side. I think he averaged 40 plus in that two year period and then came the issue in England and obviously the, the, the issues in New Zealand, the issues out the back of that New Zealand tour as well. So as the, the, the average of 29 is a bit of a misnomer because it doesn't fully tell the story of Shane Dowrich's um, career. But uh, like I say, we wish him well in retirement and we move and uh, we, we move on in the, in the drama of West Indies cricket. And let's, let's segue it there, Mash. You talked about communication. We had Kieran Powell. West Indies, well, I should say, I guess, former West Indies player because he hasn't been called up in a while. He was on a local radio station in Barbados a few days ago talking about the lack of communication selectors have with players and how certain players, he's 33, I believe, at the moment, how he feels yeah. players in and around his age group are being penalised by selectors. And it's interesting, he did note um, before the Super 50, 
players held a meeting with the selection panel. I'm assuming Desmond Haynes and Roland Butcher and Andre Fletcher, Spice Man, asked whether age would be a barrier for a selection. And players were told under no uncertain terms, if you perform in Super 50, you meet the criteria for selection. Therefore, you will be selected. Now, this just adds, <laughs> this just adds more questions, Mash, as to the whole Darren Barbo thing, because it's one thing to double down on your policy on stating, OK, we're preparing for the 2027 World Cup. We've we've quite vocally said we disagree with that policy. But if you're a selector and you're going by that, fair enough. That's your policy you're sticking with. However, if you're telling players before the tournament, if you put up runs, it doesn't matter if you're a spice man approaching 40. If you put up the runs, you're going to get selected. <laughs> Mash, this is just poor listen, communication, isn't it, at this point? <laughs> listen, And the thing is, the thing is, this was something in that Darren Bravo video I did. There was a clear line. Like, this before I even knew that Kieran Powell had... I think Kieran Powell hadn't even done the interview yet. For all I know, Kieran Powell watched my video. But in that video I did about Darren Bravo, I said, if it had been made clear to players like Darren Bravo that, you know what, we're moving on past people like you. So if you happen to score the most runs respectfully, we're, we're, we're kind of looking at a youth thing. No one kicks off, you know. I mean, they kick off about how, you, how you're just going to tell old men that they can't play, right? But at least it would have been clear that, well, you know what, this is what we're doing. And and Bravo and Cole wouldn't have been able to say, well, what is the selection criteria? And here's why Kieran Powell also has a points in Tokyo, because I just had to go put up my stats and my data. In last year's... Oh, maybe actually he's not... Sorry, in this year's... Let's go with this year's. I'll find last year's in a minute. In, in this year's Super 50, Kieran Powell was the seventh highest... Is it seventh? Four, five, six, eighth highest run scorer. In terms of openers, Santoki, he was the third best opener in the tournament, right? Um, in terms of strike rate, he had the best strike rate in the tournament for somebody who made any kind of substantial amount of runs in the tournament, right? His strike rate across uh, Super 50 was 142. To put that in perspective, um, the next highest strike rate from anyone who's in the West Indies squad was Shafane Rutherford with 102. And we know how explosive Shafane Rutherford is. So arguably, if I'm Kieran Powell, I'm looking at that going, well, boy, I did what what the mandate was in the with the bonus points. I maximized the power play. I went, I, I sacrificed myself and my own kind of targets to maximize the power play for the Leeward Islands. I, I went at a healthy strike rate, so on and so forth. His overall average was 35, by the way. Okay. So I guess Kieran Powell's looking at that going, well, he's probably a bit bitter because he's like, how come I didn't get selected? He's probably looking at Kjorn Otley and saying, how did he get selected? And I didn't get selected, right? Kjorn Otley, same age as Kieran Powell. Obviously, Otley scored more runs than him, but Otley's strike rate was 75. So I assume Kieran Powell's looking at going, hold on, how who's more suited to international cricket here? Okay. But Powell's own personal beef notwithstanding, it's not like he was just talking about himself. He said in the, if I was Darren Bravo, I'd be vexed too. Yeah. So I I don't know, Santoki. Like, can you say openly to players, age is not a barrier as long as you perform and meet the criteria you're in contention. If the, if if Powell is right and he's got no reason to lie, that was said in a massive open forum. And then a 34-year-old tops the run charts by a, a clear way, is clearly the standout player in the tournament. I think he's got every right to be vexed then. Yeah. I think this mirrors. Do you remember when um, Kevin Peterson got ditched on the England team around the Ashes and they told him, if you put up runs, you'll make the England squad again. And he scored like a triple century for Surrey or something. But then he never mm. got picked. And there was mad uproar in the English media. Not the fact that Kevin Peterson didn't get picked. It's the fact that one message was given and then the selectors contradicted themselves. I think this is exactly the same case. I think if you're a player, any trust you have with the selectors at this point, you surely lost it. Because if you're there and a man's telling you face to face, yeah, put up runs, you'll get selection. And then it's clearly not happening then obviously you've been lied to in front of your face. And I think Kieran Powell made a valid point in that interview. He said, most players are aware that if they want to speak to the selectors, they're the ones who need to pick up the phone. Otherwise, they won't get any contact. And so I think it's a very unhealthy relationship at the moment. And that's only going to strain, strain player relations with the selectors and also affect players' availability going forward. You're looking at other players witnessing what's happening. So I just think, Mash, 
again, as we kind of said, alluded to with the whole Dawit situation, it's just the lack of clear communication and sort of, it's almost as if you're saying one thing to players and then another thing, your, your words aren't supporting your action. And I think that sort of distrust it builds a very toxic atmosphere. I love, I love what you just said there about a toxic atmosphere because I, 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 I had a conversation yesterday with a, with a stakeholder in West Indies cricket um, and that individual made a point to me yesterday and I don't mean cricket West Indies here. That individual made a point to me yesterday where they said Hetmeyer and Casey Carty both got picked for the West Indies ODI squad and both had horrible super 50s, right? And his point was you're making a mockery of the selection criteria if you're allowing players to have horrible super 50s and just get picked and then not pick players who have good super 50s, meet the criteria that you're demanding, and then they don't get picked. Now, obviously, you and I both know why Hetmar's in the squad. We know what they're, they're, they're trying to invest in Casey Carty. But what then, Santoki, if, again, off the back of Kieran Powell's article and interview, sorry, what I what message are you sending to the rest of the region then? It's if I'm a player, it's telling me that boy, this is a friendship thing. It don't really matter how well you do. If you're in favor, you're in favor. And if you're not in favor, irrespective of what you do, you're not getting in. And that's not healthy. Yeah, I think with the Hetman case, like you said, we both know obviously he's he's a selection based on potential. But if you're looking at the facts. Obviously, he missed the plane, famously, to go to the World Cup, T20 World Cup. Then he did the Instagram cuss-out when he wasn't picked for the ODI World Cup qualifiers on selectors. Then when he was selected in the India series, he didn't put up runs. He didn't put up runs in Super 50, but he still made it in the squad. Whereas you've got someone like a Darren Bravo, who sort of put his head down this year, put the runs where it mattered, was told that runs is the currency that gets you in the squad. And he's not selected and told that it's because he's too old. So... Again, it, it, it almost gives the it almost gives the impression it's sort of an exclusive club at the moment for certain players. If you're and if you're a player outside of this, like a Darren Bravo, you can understand why Darren Bravo's taken a break from cricket because yeah. I can only imagine the frustration if West Indies for, for most players in the region, I know a lot of people will say, Oh, these guys are mercenaries. For most playing for West Indies is the pinnacle of your career. Like getting that getting that cap, get representing the maroon. So I think for Darren Bravo to sort of be denied that despite matching the criteria and then seeing that other players are making the squad who clearly haven't met the criteria, which has been stated, it's a kick in the teeth. And I can only imagine the sort of toll it takes on you as a professional player. So in that regard, I can also completely understand why Bravo has just decided to step away from cricket for a bit, recharge and refocus his energy. Listen, so if that's not enough, we then also received the <laughs> we then also received the news on the, I think it was on the same day as Dowrich retiring. I got a press release that was sent to my inbox or to my um to my WhatsApp saying that that Dominica had informed the government of Dominica had basically informed Cricket West Indies, you know what? <laughs> We're letting you know from now we ain't hosting no games in the C twenty <laughs> World Cup. Yes. And in fairness. A friend of mine said to me, you know what, at least Dominica are, are telling people well in advance and not leaving it to the last minute, trying to paint yeah. the stadium on the on the day before, on the day before the tournament's due to start, trying to fix things on the day before the tournament started. At least they've basically said, we can't afford this. Now, what's interesting, Santoki, is when Jamaica said, we don't want to pay for this either, there was a cuss out about, boy, Jamaica don't care about cricket, and, and we don't. Jamaica don't care about cricket and this, that, this, that. They've got they they've looked at the, the costs and benefits. It don't make no sense and, and so on and so forth. Now we've got a second island who probably wanted to probably have the cricket on like Jamaica, but saying, boy, when we weighed it up, it don't make no financial sense. We're out of this. There's a This, this is actually a topic that's a podcast episode in itself, Santoki, but does this harbour memories of 2007 and the Caribbean, which isn't a rich region by any stretch of the imagination, having to host something that actually very few of the islands, give or take Guyana with their with their with their oil, very few of the islands can actually they've got to make a massive investment and assume it's gonna come in quids in by the time the tournament's over. And two islands have said, boy. It's not worth the risk. 
Yes, and in, in the exact words, so the Ministry of Culture, Youth, Sports and Community Development in Dominica confirmed that despite the country's eagerness to host matches and tangible efforts to date, they have evaluated proposed timelines after consultation with their contractors. After considerable con consideration, it was determined that there would not be adequate time to fulfill all the ab obligations as outlined in the mem memorandum of understanding between Cricket West Indies and their government. So as you said, Mash, it's a massive investment for islands to sort of um, build the state, um, sort of get everything up to date, because obviously being an ICC World Cup, there are certain standards that need to be met. And as you said, the rewards only will come afterwards. So it's a big investment for them to put up front. And obviously, Dominica, we've seen in with the test against India, mad, mad cricket fans, you know, um, pack out stadiums. But the government has obviously weighed up and thought, you know what, financially and logistically, this isn't going to work. So it'd be interesting to see kind of how, how, hopefully we don't see any other hosts drop out. But it does also reflect the sort of economic strain that hosting the World Cup does put on in the region. And um, Johnny Grave did confirm that they are hoping to announce the final match schedule, because I know we got a lot of questions about this from fans. Final match schedule for the 2024 T20 World Cup should be announced at some point during the England series before Christmas. So we'll find out who's hosting that and who will get the extra matches, because I think Dominica were due to host two group matches and one Super 8 match. So probably keep a lookout within the next week or so. Those fans looking to travel to the region and book their tickets, you'll find out the full schedule very soon. And, Michelle, you touched there on Jamaica don't care about cricket. We also had a... I forgot who I forgot who it came from, but there was... Chris um, Deering. Chris Deering, who Deering. was a uh, key in some of the, the some of the key planning around the 2007 World Cup. Yeah, so Chris Deering essentially said... Uh, Jamaica, Jamaica should be part of should should break away from the West Indies. We've heard this argument before, but this one was was an article talking about what was his actual reasoning. Mash it was sort of there's no desire for West Indies cricket. West Indies cricket is not going to help Jamaica at this point in time. But we've heard this time and time again of islands threatening to break away, and you know it's sort of been dismissed. But do you think it has extra relevance in light of how isolated Jamaica does feel from the cricket and landscape in regards to the rest of the West Indies at the moment? So I think one thing that we need to do, I'm going to I'm going to reach out to Chris through some intermediary in intermediaries because I know people who know him. And I think I'm going to reach out to him and say, you know what, come on the show, come on the show and let's talk about this one. Because Chris is an intelligent man. So, I mean, I mean, I mean, I'm interested and intrigued that he's the one to make this argument. Now, what I will say, Santoki, is this and I've been meaning to do this Jamaica episode for a while and haven't had the haven't had the chance to try and pin everybody down to do it. So Chris probably needs to now be on the panel. But when I was in Jamaica this summer, and I was there for about three weeks, when I was in Jamaica this summer, no one I spoke to cared about cricket. No one. Now, that's a very small uh, sample size, and I've extrapolated that to make this point. But there is very much. And we already know what was happening this summer. So buying a park is used for, for, for parties and um, live music and Jamaica Premier League football, right? The, the, the last thing to buy in the park is be really being used for these days is cricket. Um, we already saw that the Talawas still ain't come back, still haven't gone back to Jamaica since 2019. Um, the, the Jamaican government made it clear that they don't see any financial benefit to bidding for World Cup games. Um, similarly, you could argue that the Jamaican government isn't kicking down the door to host West Indies games either uh, in general. So in some senses, although we've heard these arguments before, I think Chris Durin, and that, again, we need to get him on to clarify this, maybe he's coming at this from a point of view of, we Jamaicans just ain't studying cricket right now. Now, I wouldn't, I would never back the idea that Jamaica should jump out of West Indies cricket. Yeah. Um, and certainly I hope that his suggestion isn't that we should jump out to then go it on our own. I want to know if his if his I want to know if his argument is we should jump out of West Indies cricket and just never exist in cricket again. That's what I really want. To, that, that's more I want to know. If that's what that. argument is. <laughs> so that's that's why I want him to clarify it because as much as we're joking about it, that makes more sense to me than jump out of West Indies cricket to try and go it on our own because none of the, I don't care which island reckon or country believes they can. Barbados can't go it on their own. Guyana can't go it on their own. Jamaica can't go it on their own. 
Trinidad can't go on their own. And respectfully, the Leeward and Wimmer Islands also can't go it on their own. So the wider argument makes no sense. But if the argument is let's just give up on cricket, then I understand where he's coming from. Boy, and if, if, if we've got, as you said, he's an intellectual man. If we've got someone saying uh, Jamaica should just ditch cricket altogether, then West Indies really are down bad at the moment. <laughs> so, mm. um, but yeah, I think, Mash, we said, we, we as always, we said we'll try to keep this to 20 minutes. We've gone over 30 minutes. We could probably talk a bit longer. But people listening, watching, if you want to see more of these type of videos where we sort of summarise what's going on in West Indies cricket, comment below. And if we get enough votes, if we get enough people who want to see more of this type of content, we'll try to do like a weekly news roundup episode, keeping everyone up to date with the latest happenings in West Indies cricket. Um, we'll probably do a predicted ODI um, 11 video in the coming 24 hours, looking ahead towards the first ODI. And Sunday night, we'll definitely have a live review show looking at whatever happens in the first ODI between West Indies or England. It could be a glorious day for West Indies cricket, or it could be another disastrous chapter in our ODI history. So stay locked for that. As always, comment, like, subscribe, share. Our most recent live video of Darren Bravo has done about 16,000 views right now. So thank you for all the support. And let's keep the Caribbean Cricket Podcast movement going. Michelle, I'll hand over the last words to you. Yeah, most definitely, people. Everything that Santoki said, keep, uh, keep your eyes out for more content. And I just want to clarify again, lest anybody thinks our message was muddled. As we have have it understood from official sources, the some of the stories being put out from various media outlets about what did or did not go on in camp are incorrect uh have uh they have been refuted categorically um re shane dowrich and we wish shane dowrich well on his retirement but as santoki says like share subscribe all of that all of that and look out for more content coming peace we rule the cricket world now the rules Welcome to the Caribbean Cricket Podcast, your one-stop shop for all things West Indies cricket, by the fans, for the fans.